Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We've arrived at lesson seven of our second quarter study, all about the book of Genesis. And this is the week titled, The Covenant with Abraham. Indeed. And, and Pastor Howard, you were putting this one together particularly, but the, the biblical foundation for this week's study is rather heavy. Oh, I, it's it's, it's yes. a lot there, right? It's Genesis 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. That's right. Wow. Okay. And for any of you who are even, you know, superficially aware of those chapters, there's a lot in those things yeah. that could be, you know, conversation. As we're, as we're going to soon see. Exactly. <laughs> so we don't have any time to waste on other things. We've got a lot to dive into here. But uh, how about I start with a word of prayer and then yes. you can walk us through. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to know you and to study your word. Help us as we study now today this particular portion of scripture. Help it to become clear in our minds for our own edification, but also for our Sabbath school classes. They may be blessed by a discussion of these important things. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, as you mentioned, this week's lesson is reviewing God's covenant with Abraham broadly mm -hmm. in, in Genesis uh, you know, 15 through uh, 18, and then you go to, into the destruction of Sodom. So that's okay. all encapsulated in this week's lesson. Okay. Talking point number one, drawn from Sunday and Monday, is that Abraham's story illustrates righteousness by faith. Now, this is not a new thing. We've touched on this in previous quarterlies. We'll look at maybe a couple of different aspects today, but Abraham's story illustrates yeah. righteousness Paul certainly by faith. makes that point, doesn't yes. he? Yeah. Talking point number two, we are not under law, but under grace. And we build that on Tuesday and Wednesday, and we're actually going to delve into the circumcision covenant and how that mm. relates there. So kind of fascinating, fascinating stuff. And then number three, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Hmm. And that's drawn from Thursday's lesson and the destruction of Sodom. So these talking points are each. I just noticed this, like two, not under law, under grace, uh, hates the sin, loves the sinner. Those are pretty um, catchy little phrases there. You know, those are kind of common. Uh, you know, once in a blue moon, Cameron. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, yeah, simple, straightforward. Let's go. So let's talk about Abraham's story, illustrating righteousness by faith. Uh, of course. You have, now, Genesis 15 is not where God calls Abraham. That's actually in Genesis 12, yes. where you have that first call. And then it's reiterated in Genesis 15. The lesson points out, which we'll touch on in a minute, that Abraham seems a little bit discouraged. He's come through the, the, the uh, uh, battle with the kings. Still all has the no bloodshed child. Exactly. and warfare, which, uh, if you read this in Patriarchs and Prophets, he now figures, I've made them mad at me. And they're going to be, my whole life now is going to be me. unrest. I used to have this life of peace. And I've done, and, and by, besides all that, where's my child that I'm going to have this? And so in that little bout of despondency, God comes back to Abram, promises, reinstitutes the promise to Abram. Abraham, you know, how am I going to become a great nation if I only have a leaser in my household, a servant, I don't have my own mm. son. And God brings him outside and he shows him the stars of heaven. And he says, so shall your descendants be. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, Abraham in Genesis, Abraham believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Yes. And now the apostle Paul picks up on that phrase in Romans 4, 3, where he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. A little bit different phrasing. It's kind of fat. We're not even going to delve into all that. Okay. There's so much I want to do on this topic. There's so, but what we want to highlight is this experience of Abraham. I mean, you take, he came out from um, among his, his family at, yes. at 75 years old to head off. He didn't know to where. To an unknown land, yeah. All of that was built, was predicated on his trust in God's promises. Mm-hmm. And so that whole experience, obviously, he believed God. And what pressed him on every day? Why didn't he just go back home and where he had mm. comfort and he knew how things worked? And I mean, who wants to be in a strange place? You ever travel to a, a foreign country and then you get back home and it's like, oh, home, you know, familiarity. <laughs> There's something yeah. about familiarity. I've gone to other countries where they don't have the same restaurants and stores and whatever mm. when you drive. And there's just something about familiarity. Mm -hmm. But the Bible's clear that Abraham could have always gone back, but he didn't. Along mm. with the others, it says in Hebrews, he kept plowing forward. Why? Because of his trust in the Lord. That whole experience of Abraham was predicated mm. on his faith and his trust in God's promise. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's fascinating, especially when you again get to the context, because we you could pull that Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness out of a vacuum and study right. it. But when you look at the context of the flow of the story, where he is in his age and life, his experience of fear with now the battle stuff, and he's got the whole not having a baby yet, he's in a strange land. And he's just going to plug away right. and keep believing. Yeah. In fact, the lesson top t uh, touches on this uh, Sabbath afternoon it, in the second paragraph. Um, well, here. You want to read that? Sabbath, Sabbath afternoon, Sabbath second afternoon. paragraph? Sure. You were right there. This yeah. episode of Abraham's life is full of fear and laughter. Abram is afraid, Genesis 15.1. As are Sarah, Genesis 18.5. And Hagar, Genesis 21.17. Abram laughs, Genesis 17.17. 17. And Sarah, Genesis 18.12, and Ishmael, too, Genesis 21.9. These chapters resonate with human sensitivity and warmth. Abram is passionate about the salvation of the wicked Sodomites. He's caring towards Sarah, Hagar, and Lot, and he is hospitable toward the three foreigners. Uh, I.e., Abraham was a regular guy. Yeah, he was a in dude. In other words, yeah. we tend to look at, you know, Abraham was a hero in the Bible. He's a hero of faith. He's the mm. father of the faithful. Uh, Paul goes on to point that out. Uh, I have in a bullet point that Abraham's story is recorded for all believers. It was interesting to me that uh, Tuesday's lesson touches mm -hmm. on the idea that links Genesis 17 and the reiterating of the covenant and circumcision and what have you there and Genesis 3.15 with the promise of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then it says that we could deduce from these two things, <laughs> you know, that perhaps... Yeah. And there might know, be a that, hint of uh, that, that, yeah. that that Abraham's the promise to Abraham was broader than just Abraham. It reached mm. beyond him to other nations. It, or I thought we could just read Genesis twelve three, where God says <laughs> that you're going to be uh, uh, basically a blessing to the whole all world. Nations all nations will yeah. be blessed in you. Right. And then of course. Um, Paul emphasizes it in Romans that Abraham is not just the father of the circumcision, he's the father of the faithful. Now, I say that to make that when we read this story, Abraham's story illustrates righteousness by faith, our first talking point. The point is that because it's a story for everybody mm -hmm. who obtains righteousness by faith, which is the only way anybody's saved, it's a lesson for all of us of how that experience works. And so when we look at Abraham and realize he was a real guy and he did have a real journey and this wasn't all... His lifetime was not, not all just peaks. Right. Well, and it'd be one valleys. thing, you know, Paul here in Romans chapter 1, you have it in the notes, but verses 16 and 17, we talks about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know, he right. says in verse 17, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That's right. Just as in the just shall live by faith. So a life lived in faith is not just going from sinner to saint. Right. But it's a faith. It's not just leads one faith, day, a one-day faith. faith experience. And that's exactly what the whole saga of Abraham is, right. illustrates, you know, because even the whole plodding forward in faith. Well, we kind of overskip the whole, like, deception with the Egyptian. Right. And then kind of the... Yeah, she's not my wife, she's my sister. Right. And, and then... All the mess with a lot. Yes. That maybe could have been avoided. And then the, we're going to get into the Hagar issues and stuff. So eventually he'll get to Mount Moriah. And right. now I know. But it took, a, it took a process to get there. And I praise the Lord that the Bible does point out the ideal of faith and then the practicality of faith to faith to get there. That's right. Anyway. And so it's a, it, it should be a lesson of encouragement to us to see some a, a person of great faith like Abraham who ha still had to grow into that yes. experience. He didn't have the final test until Genesis 22, which we haven't gotten to here. So right. even with all this journey. Before shadowing, we will get to next week. So it's not going to be lost. That's right. So... <laughs> Uh, talking point number two, we are not under law, but under grace, brings us up to Genesis 17. So we need to bring a little background story Well, it also here. seems to match with the whole, what we just ended with there in the first talking point is there's a destination of faith, but along the way it's a faith by faith, faith to faith journey, right? That's right. And so how does that relate to the, I'm not under law, but under grace? You right. know, let's tie those together a little bit. Well, first of all, uh, I, I'd like to touch on the idea that I feel like we're, we're going to be racing through this outline because if I were teaching a class, I'd certainly be looking up some of these passages. Mm. Um, there's just so much in the lesson, and I want to highlight some points. But in the story of Abraham, you know, God promises Abraham when he's 75. When he's 85 years old, Genesis 15, he comes out and he's like, I don't have any descendants yet. Mm -hmm. Then God makes the promise to him, and he goes on trusting in that promise. I have to review my facts there. When God calls him in Genesis 12, he's, he's 75 years old. Yes. 
But the point is, by the time he has Ishmael, the Bible says he's 86 when Ishmael's born. So he's about 85 years old. It's been about 10 years when he and Sarah, Sarah comes to him and says, you know, God promised you a child that's going to come from you, but he didn't necessarily say it's going to come from me. (laughs) And she had a slave girl and said, maybe you can go into her because Sarah was barren. She couldn't Mm -hmm. have children. And the, the, the whole thing there is fascinating. In other words, from a human standpoint, it was impossible. And so in this lesson of faith, there's, in the heart of it, there's something that, ha- that the Bible's telling us that there are things that God promises us that may seem impossible to us. Yes. And because of that, we try to negate them and then work out some alternative plan. And, and what's interesting in, in my reckoning with that is that Abraham didn't doubt the final outcome. No. It was just the steps to get there. Yeah, how do he was I like, get there I trust that God's going to make a great nation, but maybe... Uh, he needs a little help this way, or maybe we can short circuit this a little bit and make a cut, shortcut, and or maybe he needs my. Like he he sometimes right. arrogated himself to a position of co-working out this That's kind right. of thing, and it's so again whether it's the deception, the Hagar thing, whatever, he trusts in the big picture end result, but it's all those steps in between where he seems to fall. Sure, through. the end result is God said you're gonna be a father of many nations totally that are going to be born from the son that you don't have. Right. And so he and Sarah and Hagar worked out this thing where it's like, we'll make sure you get a son. Yeah. And you go in and we'll sleep with We'll work out God's my, promise from, yeah. We'll, we'll sleep, you'll sleep with my slave girl. Yeah. And lo and behold, that's exactly what he did and had a son, Ishmael, and he thought Ishmael is going to be, this is the one that that is going to be the child and of promise. And he, it's not like, obviously we know Isaac is later born, but it's not like he was born the next year, the next year. I mean, he has time to grow up with Ishmael. You know, I, I don't know if we're getting into that right now, but he has a he has a, 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 a tender fatherly regard for Ishmael, right? And yes. he eventually says, oh, the Ishmael might live before you. Can't we just yes. go out in the way I've built up? And how many of us in our faith experiences, Lord, why can't it be the mm. way I want to do it instead of what Absolutely. you have to do? Mercy. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting, the, the, you know, the lesson conjectures a little bit on Tuesday, uh, it says it's also significant, significant that this covenant ser- signified by circumcision is described in terms that point back to the first messianic prophecy, and the par- parallel with two um, suggests this broadness of, of Abraham's plan, and then it goes on, uh, it's before that actually, it says the meaning of circumcision has long been discussed and debated by scholars. Uh, this does not have to be complicated. It may be a little uncomfortable to discuss, but the point is Mm -hmm. that circumcision was not in God's original plan. Right. God brought this about after this whole Sarah Hagar debacle. Let's be clear. It wasn't that it just wasn't his original plan from creation. Even after the fall, he didn't give this to Adam. That's right. And he didn't give it to Cain and Abel. The whole thing. And and even even in the call in Genesis 12, you're going to be great. He doesn't do it then. No. It's only in the context it of his... It is directly yes. connected to the Sarah Hagar yes. experience. Yes, it is. And it is directly connected to the portion of Abraham's body in which mm. he tried to work out God's plan. Yeah, that so reproductive I said, it element that God thing? has said, I'm going to take care of. He's like, yeah. no, I got this. And mm. the sign is a cutting away of the flesh, mm. which has a spiritual significance to the flesh, as the Bible yeah, always talks about. Representative of the whole person. Of the yeah. carnal nature of man getting in the way yes. of God's plans. And so what's interesting is God gives this right to Abraham as a sign to Abraham that God is the one that's going to work the promises out, not Abraham. Yes. That righteousness comes from God, not from Amen. Abraham. So circumcision was given as a sign Mm-hmm. of righteousness by faith that comes from God, but the Jewish nation perverted it over time to become the means of obtaining righteousness Mercy. by God. Mm. And so when you come to Acts chapter 15, even in the New Testament church, there was this contention, and there were those who said, unless you keep uh, uh, the, the law, law of Moses... To and are circumcised, yes. you cannot be saved. Right, so now it becomes the means of salvation, where before <laughs> right. it was the sign of salvation. By the way, sometimes Christians will mis- misread, I believe, Genesis 15, uh, Acts 15, thinking that the issue was about circumcision. No, it wasn't. It was about mandatory circumcision That's for exactly salvation. Right. Because Paul As went and means. had... The very next chapter, Paul had Timothy, you know, circumcised. But it wasn't for his salvation. It was to be winsome for others as a That's Jew. I became right. a Jew. That's exactly no right. No worries. So the right itself physically is not like some sinful thing that we're now forbidden to do. But the meaning of it was lost on that New Testament right. church. They were saying, no, no, you have to cut the flesh physically. And Paul's whole point throughout the New Testament is 
you know that represents the heart, the whole yes. man, right? So, Well, that transitions nicely to the idea then of the moral law. So in the ceremonial law, where we have circumcision as a part, and as mm -hmm. you said, they, there's that shifting from it becoming a, being a sign of salvation to the means that there wasn't something wrong with the circumcision itself, but right. how they were using it, and thus we come to the commandments of God. Now, the commandments of God were never given by God so that we could be saved by keeping them. Yes. That was never his... The law was not given for justification by the law is the knowledge of sin. Mm -hmm. But what happened is it got perverted to where the idea was obedience to the law. That's going to save me. Just, mm -hmm. like, just like getting circumcised is going to mm -hmm. save me. It was flipped. So when we come to this terminology in the New Testament, now most Seventh-day Adventists are familiar with this term under, under the law. Mm -hmm. We hear when we talk about the Sabbath with our Sunday keeping friends, they say, well, Bible says in Romans 6, 14, we're not under the law, but under grace. Mm -hmm. And and they interpret, and many of us fall for interpreting that phrase under the law to mean under obligation to, to obey. Keep, yeah. That's not how the apostle uses it. And I have this in the notes. The phrase under the law as used by the apostle does not refer to being under obligation to obey the law. Instead, it refers to those who would use obedience to law as the means of justification. Mm. That's why the lesson highlights in this context of circumcision, Galatians 4.21, mm -hmm. where Paul says, You who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? <laughs> and his point is, those of you who think you're going to be saved by your obedience to the law, don't you understand what the law is asking you to do? Don't you understand that it's impossible in your own strength to do that unless you're converted, unless you have mm. the fleshly tablet of the heart, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the flesh of the carnal nature cut away and you have the, the heart renewed? Yes. You're not going to be able to keep it. And so he's, he's um, making this point that the, the problem, much as with circumcision, was not with the right itself, but the mentality that I'm mm -hmm. going to save myself by right. my own works. And, and that's, that's what, what he means by under something, that I am under obligation to aid. And if I, if I fulfill those obligations, then I have come. That's exactly right. And he's like, that's not what it means. In fact, I think it's an interesting tie between what Paul speaks about in Galatians 4.21, yes. about hearing the law if you would desire to be under the law, and the very next verse for it is written that Abraham had two sons, and he uses right. the experience of Abraham and these two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, as illustrative of his point about the obligation to the law versus grace. You know, And you have this handy little chart in the notes there about the difference, spiritual yes. application difference between Ishmael and Isaac. Now, obviously, in the literal, Ishmael, of course, was born of Hagar, the slave woman. Isaac was born of Sarah, the, the free right. woman, his wife. And there's all kinds of differences. But Paul takes those differences and makes spiritual applications one-to-one. -one. Well, exactly. You had made, you know, of course, so he likens Ishmael to the Old Covenant and Isaac to the New Covenant. He likens, the, and he's taking this whole experience to, mm -hmm. to illustrate. He, he points to the fact that Isaac was born, I'm sorry, Ishmael was born according to the flesh. That is the the plan yes, of the weakness man. of his faith to act it out in a way that God Well, specifically, did. yeah, the the born according to the flesh, according to man's idea of how to end efforts mm -hmm. to obtain the promise of God. That's right. Versus Isaac, who was born according to the promise. Mm -hmm. And that becomes clearer in the passage in Galatians. He also talks about the fact that Ishmael was born from Hagar. His mother was a slave. Mm -hmm. Now, if your mother's a slave, you cannot be born free. Mm -hmm. And Yet uh, Isaac's mother was free, and so he was born free. And he's using this to, again, draw these distinctions that uh, he clarifies, I think, a little further when he makes the point that the one who is born of the flesh, uh, I'm sorry, verse 29 of Galatians 4 says, As he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Even so it is now. So now he doesn't say born according to promise. Mm -hmm. In the context of Galatians, the promise is the promise of the Spirit. So now he draws the this distinction. There's equivalence there between the promise and, being, and following the Spirit of God. That the, right? that the plan of Abraham and, and Sarah and Hagar was a plan according to the flesh, whereas God's promise was according to the Spirit. Salvation is according to the Spirit. Circumcision was given as a sign to Abraham that the work of God is accomplished by the Spirit, not by the mm. flesh, but it became perverted. And in the same way... And ironically became a, yet another work of the flesh. That's he was right. Like, the whole thing is a point away from that. Yeah. And, and thus, in, in, in the same way, in the covenants, in the Old and New Covenant, in the Old Covenant, 
the law of God, which should be a reminder to us that we serve God and of find our righteousness in him, in him, became a means of obtaining righteousness, mm. became a work of the flesh, um, because, and I summarize this on the, on the top of uh, our next page handout, in the words of Jesus, John 3, 6, that which is born of flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Mm. If you're carnal, you can't produce things that are spiritual. Yeah. No effort of a carnal man is ever going to be a spiritual effort mm. until the man becomes a spiritual you man, until the heart again. is changed. That's the context That's exactly of John right. 3. Yeah. And in fact, in commenting on being born again, uh, and that very verse, uh, Ellen White comments in Desire of Ages. Why don't you read what it says there? Yeah, 172, Desire of Ages. The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works and keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Powerful. Powerful. Well, there's more that could be said on that, but we need to move to, to talking point number three as we go from this experience. <laughs> I can't we, believe all of this is in one lesson, but let's do one we more. We go from this experience into the destruction of Sodom. And my talking point there is that God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. And you know, Pastor Howard, it is interesting. We go from this whole, can't you see how much God loves and his grace and his mercy? And we're not under law, we're under mm -hmm. grace. Anyway, next point, God destroys all these people. Like, I thought we just <laughs> talked about how God is, you know, all this love and mercy and grace and we're not under law. And then he turns around to these law-breaking people and destroys them. So there's an interesting juxtaposition in these stories. Well, we're going to see a lot of mercy in that story, too, in the little time okay. we have left. Romans 1.18, the Bible says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress mm. the truth in unrighteousness. And so it's interesting to point out that God's wrath is not against ungodly people, but against the ungodliness of people. Mm. And that's my point. That's that God important. hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Interestingly, uh, the hatred, God's hatred for sin, mm -hmm. his wrath, is directly proportionate to his love for the sinner. Mm. In other words, God hates sin because it destroys the sinner who he loves. And mm. the more destructive sin is to the sinner, the more he hates the thing destroying mm. If God didn't care about us, he wouldn't have wrath against sin. He loves sin because sin would destroy us and get rid of us. So that intensity so, of the love is exactly why there's such intensity of the sin that's destroying that which and, he loves. And keep in mind that the, the intention of the wrath is not to destroy the sinner, but the sin. Mm. Thus, the gospel message is to try to plead with the sinner to be separated, mm. allow God to separate us from our sin, put in that new heart and what have yes. you. Uh, but God can't allow sin to continue forever. Mm. For the sake of all humanity, for the sake of all the universe, and time doesn't permit a full discussion on sure. that, but the, the, this outpouring of God's wrath on Sodom was in that very context. God's wrath was against the sin, not the sinner. The Bible says, why don't you read it in Genesis 19, verse 13. Sure. It says here, For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Those, of course, being the angel messengers who were going on to yes. on their errand That's of, right. of destruction. And, and, the, and the reason given was because there's an outcry from there that's to right. God, and he's come down to investigate. The Sodomites, incidentally, were not passive victims in their society. They mm. were oppressive, and we see that in the illustration of the story. Mm -hmm. And thus, there's an outcry, evidently, of God's people. And my mind goes to whether it be Psalm 34, 15, and 16, or where Peter quotes from that psalm in 1 Peter 3, 12. He says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do mm. evil. The righteous were crying out to God because of this oppressiveness of Sodom, and God had heard the cries, evidently, or the cries maybe not in Sodom, but in the surrounding but about area Sodom. and what have you, yeah. because we know that whole, if there were, you know, well, we know that, anyway, we know that... Well, uh, this is so reminiscent of the Cain and Abel experience where your brother's blood cries out to the ground for me. Yes. Because of that thing, I now have a duty to investigate right. and deal with this. And here, the, the, the sin of Sodom, which we sometimes, you know, I've heard it described mm -hmm. as, you know, they were just inhospitable mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I'm like, well, uh, you read the story in the Bible, and we're not 
I'm not recommending you get yes. into graphic illustration of this, but you have a, a group of men who are violently trying to press in on these strangers to that's have exactly their way right. with them. And that's exactly what the Bible describes uh, in Jude 1, 7. It, Jude only yes. has one chapter, of course. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the, other, and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. There was some... There was some intense sinning in that Sodom That's and right. Gomorrah plane, you know, and I don't know, you know. The, well, think, you mentioned the sexual immorality Jude mentions in the strange flesh or the ESV says unnatural desires. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is that takes you over to Romans 1 exactly where, where it talks about the wrath of God. And it says that the uh, I think in Romans 1, the woman has exchanged that which is natural for that which is unnatural. Right. And it says in verse 27, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. So in Paul's denunciation of wickedness, he yes. uses this particular type of sin as an illustration. Jude does the same thing. So it's not like so you have a God sin. randomly picked a, a town and said, oh, I'm going to no. destroy this one. They were particularly wicked at that time. You have a sin of homosexuality, and I know that's a hot topic today, mm -hmm. but for the Christian, we've got to let God define right and wrong. Mm. And incidentally, as our lesson will highlight, well, first of all, let's talk about, uh, it also mentions sexual immorality. So this isn't, this isn't limited to homosexuality. You've no. got Lot's two daughters right. trying to get impregnated by their father. So you have this extent of sexual immorality yeah, that's manifested in all these all ways. There's depravity all across the board here in Sodom. Yeah. And something else that we need to be clear on is that if God announces something as sin, there are all kinds of things that we may not see as sinful. And I'm not talking about sexual immorality now. I'm talking about anything. If God announces something as a sin, then we need to say it's a sin mm. <laughs> and we need to be willing to reform the keep in mind again god hates the sin but loves the sinner and if mm. i refuse god's merciful entreaties to allow him to take that sin out of my life one day he's going to destroy all sin together and i'll be mm. destroyed with it if i don't allow that to happen mm. now there's an interesting statement here on steps to christ uh from steps to christ page 30 why don't you read what it says there? It says, God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in his estimation as well as in that of man. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem in the eyes of men, no sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is partial, imperfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. So I think that's really interesting. There's degrees, but n no degree is small. That's right. So there's only, you know, large and extra large in God's sight. You know, there's no such thing as small. Well, in the broader statement, there's interesting. Elmite talks about the kind of uh, 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 sins that we get away with in society, whether mm. it be pride or gossiping or things little like that. Little white lies, little slant. And there's yeah. no little white. That's the That's point right. is, um, so Sodom is an example, the Bible says, to those who would afterward live ungodly, mm -hmm. regardless what that level of ungodliness is. We're right. not trying to single out one sin and say these are worse sinners. It just happens the to be the lesson one that, of yeah. Sodom is a lesson that God is trying desperately to save mm. and that God's people want desperately to save. So where do we find Abraham? He's pleading for the people yes, in is. Sodom. And Ellen White makes a fascinating statement we're going to close with. This is actually in Friday's lesson as well. Mm. But I'm going to ask if you would read that from Patriarchs sure. and Prophets on Friday as we conclude this lesson. She writes, All around us are souls going down to ruin as hopeless, as terrible as that which befell Sodom. Every day the probation of some is closing. Every hour some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. And where are the voices of warning and entreaty to bid the sinner flee from this fearful doom? Where are the hands stretched out to draw him back from death? Where are those who with humility and persevering faith are pleading with God for him? The spirit of Abraham was the spirit of Christ. The Son of God is himself the great intercessor in the sinner's behalf. He who has paid the price for its redemption knows the worth of the human soul. Amen. All right, friends, there's a lot to cover this week, and we've already burned through a lot of time here today, but uh, I, don't, I don't doubt your Sabbath classes are going to be a, a, a rich blessing, and we just want to close with prayer that the Lord will truly give you a great experience. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you for the study we've had today, and thank you for the studies that will be coming up this week in Sabbath school. Bless every teacher, bless every member, and by your grace, help us to be more like Jesus. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.